You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. This week, we watched the number of confirmed coronavirus cases in the United States reach a record high of 3 million. In our last podcast, we talked about the psychological impact of hearing that 10 million people had been infected worldwide. Now, it is 12 million. So these are numbers that are not numbers that other presidents would have, and they won't have it. The only thing they can kill, it's a bad president. And remember what we mentioned in the last podcast, that other statistic that doesn't get as much attention, and that's the number of people who have recovered. At the moment, it is six and a half million people. But there were two things that happened outside of the United States that you need to know about. Firstly, the World Health Organization sent a team to China to investigate the potential origins of the coronavirus in Wuhan. And secondly, a study that shows 90,000 of Chinese students enrolled in Australian universities now indicate that they no longer want to study in Australia. What's the link, you ask? It all started with a statement from this man at the end of April. Is Australia still going to push for an independent inquiry into the origins of COVID-19 in Geneva at the World Health Assembly? Australia will continue to, of course, pursue what is a very reasonable and sensible course of action. This is a virus that has taken more than 200,000 lives across the world. It has shut down global, the global economy. The implications and impacts of this are extraordinary. Now, it would seem entirely reasonable and sensible that the world would want to have an independent assessment of how this all occurred so we can learn the lessons and prevent it from happening again. I don't think this is a remarkable suggestion. I think it's a fairly obvious and common sense suggestion. That was Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia. Now this week, he made world news when he announced Australia was cancelling its extradition treaty with Hong Kong and giving Hong Kongers in Australia with temporary visas a special five-year extension and a pathway to become Australian citizens. But back in April, his announcement of the need for an inquiry caused a reaction from the Beijing central government that set several events in motion. And the result just might cost the Australian economy hundreds of billions of dollars. Welcome to the Inside China podcast. My name is Kinling Lo. And with me here is someone who's always in the room when we produce Inside China, but until now has never been heard. G'day Kinling. Hello everyone. My name's Jared Watt. This week, we're going to talk about the relationship between China and Australia as a result of the pandemic. It's complicated. And this week, our usual warning to you, the listener, is more important than ever. It's not just the pandemic that's a developing story. There is so much developing at the moment. We strongly recommend you check the South China Morning Post website at scmp.com for the latest news updates and analysis. This week, you're going to hear from one of our colleagues who's been closely following the developments between China and Australia. And you're going to hear from a researcher who's uncovered what might just be a multi-billion dollar problem for Australia that might derail its entire tertiary education system. All those developments actually are captured by the social media, by the netizens. Many of them never had experience living in Australia or studied in Australia. So they interpret this as um, a hostile country following the US and uh, putting this stigma on China. But importantly, we're also going to show it's not all bad news and diplomatic tension between Australia and China. Chinese and Australian scientists are working together as part of the global effort to find a vaccine to end this pandemic. And you're going to hear from the CEO of a company running human trials of a Chinese-made vaccine in one of the world's most isolated cities. When it comes to fighting a global pandemic, uh, we're not going to get anywhere as a community until we take a global approach to this. Let's recap exactly what Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison was saying back in April about investigating the sources of coronavirus. 
He launched his very public campaign to reform the World Health Organization and was quoted as saying he wanted it to have the same kinds of powers as United Nations weapons inspectors. Not long after, China's ambassador, Chang Jingyi, was interviewed on one of Australia's national newspapers, the Australian Financial Review. This is some of what he had to say in response to Scott Morrison's comments. The Chinese public is frustrated, dismayed and disappointed with what Australia is doing now, he said. I think in the long term, if the mood is going from bad to worse, people would think, why should we go to such a country that is not so friendly to China? The tourists may have second thoughts. But then he added something that sent chills down the spines of Australia's business community. The parents of the students would also think whether this place, which they found is not so friendly, even hostile, whether this is the best place to send their kids here. It is up to the people to decide, maybe the ordinary people will say, why should we drink Australian wine, eat Australian beef? The ambassador of Australia's largest trading partner had essentially just threatened the three biggest export industries outside of mining that helped generate more than 135 billion US dollars each year for the Australian economy. But let's get some analysis on what's happened between China and Australia since that announcement in April by Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. Su Lin Tan works on a political economy desk here at the South China Morning Post. Hi, Su Lin. Hi, how are you? Su Lin, take us back to mid-May. It's the meeting of the World Health Assembly for the World Health Organization. Australia makes its formal request for an inquiry into COVID-19. And about three hours later, China makes a special announcement concerning a very specific Australian export market. What happened? Well, that interesting event actually surrounds the uh, barley sector. Barley is, you know, is a, is a big export from Australia to China. Uh, uh, three hours later from that, you know, the announcement, China slapped an anti-dumping uh, subsidy, about 80.5%. When you think about it, 80.5% is a lot. When, you know, these two countries are trading at zero tariffs, essentially saying that Australia had dumped too much cheap barley in China to gain market share, and thus it outcompetes with their local farmers. Wait, so this was announced three hours right after the World Health Assembly meeting. Do we think this is a coincidence or not? Well, some people might actually say it's a coincidence because they had already planned uh, the announcement on May the 19th. They've actually been investigating anti-dumping for 18 months prior to May the 19th, and they said last uh, December that they would make an announcement on May the 19th. That was before the coronavirus outbreak happened. So it isn't quite targeted in a sense, but you know, countries like China in a multilateral sort of you know diplomacy approach could have gone, well, maybe we should just wait it out or talk quietly behind closed doors rather than announcing it quite openly in, in the open forum as they did. Wait, Celine, so I have a dumb question. What does China use barley for? Well, mainly barley is used for uh, live cattle feed, so food for cows and also to make beer. So those are the two things that you, barley is used for in China. Are you saying that it will cost more for Chinese people to buy Qingdao or will there be beer left for them at all? Well, this is what Australia likes uh, to think, that it's going to cost more. But the th here's the thing, there are many, many barley supplies to China. Canada is one of them, the U.S., so, and Canada's, Canada's been ramping up heavily as a big exporter of good barley to, to, to China. Now, barley comes in different grades, right? So, you want barley, a certain kind of barley for certain craft beer, for example, and maybe the Australian grain might be a lot better for certain kinds of beer. But it doesn't mean that no other grain or no other barley can be made into beer. For that matter, Canadian barley can also be turned into good beer in China when this is what they have. They have alternative markets. So you also mentioned cattle. So that was the next big decision China made against Australia. What happened then? Well, certainly, most surprisingly, after they, they slapped a ban on um, exports from four abattoirs in Australia. And these four abattoirs are big abattoirs, and they constitute a large amount of beef exports to, to China. And just to get a better idea of how big the market is for Australian beef in mainland China, I got someone on the line from Beijing just happened to be driving his car to the airport at the time. My name is uh, Gerard Liu and uh, I uh, work for uh, Meat International Group, MIG. 
Yeah. Jared is a senior analyst for the meat industry group in Beijing. They consult with companies all over the world who want to export meat to mainland China, and they've got a lot of experience with the Australian industry. To give you an idea of just how much Australian beef exports to mainland China are worth, here's what he's witnessed in the past eight years. I can say it's grown significantly, right? And uh, because uh, I just gave some rough idea, and uh, in 2012, the total import volume to China is around uh, 25,000 tons. 25,000 tons of beef going from Australian farms to mainland China. That's in 2012. Uh, last year, in 2019, the number for Australian beef only it's around uh, 260,000 tons, you know. Uh, the number, is, you know, is very, very big. In just eight years, Australian exports of beef to China have increased 10 times. That's huge. Yes, yes, it's a uh, huge. It, you know, the, we, we deal with the data seriously. So in the last uh, few years, I think the average growth rate is around uh, 40 to 50% every year. So I asked Jared what's been powering this huge increase in China's appetite for Australian beef. And he put it down to one factor, the growth of China's middle class. But it's not just politics that's having an influence on the cost of Australian beef. The huge increase in demand has triggered a provision in the Chinese-Australian Free Trade Agreement, known as CHAFTA. That puts a 12% tariff on Australian beef for the rest of this year and he's seeing a double barrel impact for the Chinese market. It will make the Australian beef less competitive compared to the beef from other countries, like uh, New Zealand and like uh, South America. It will definitely impact the market. And uh, you know, uh, the other thing and I can observe is uh, many importers they have uh, asked uh, their exporters to send the shipment as soon as early. Chinese buyers saw this increase coming and asked their Australian suppliers to send as much beef as they could before the tariffs were triggered. But that was a few months ago. The decision that made world headlines was back in May. Another decision rocketed through world headlines in May. And that's when China decided to ban imports from four Australian abattoirs. Suleen, you did stories about these abattoirs. So what happened then? Well, we actually looked further into these four abattoirs and we actually noticed that they had form. I mean, they had form in, you know, the, what China had called them up on, which is mislabeling, you know, some of the stock had um, were, were wrongly sent and the, the cuts were wrong. So it's not the first time that these abattoirs have made the mistake that China are accusing them of. They are sending a lot of beef and it's common to actually make these mistakes. So these are not new or unusual. However, these abattoirs are also not free of wrongdoing either. Well, dare I say, the, as always with you know, contemporary Australian society, the elephant in the room, the dark shadow, is racism. And you've done stories also tracking the increase in racist incidents against Chinese people, against Asian people, as this pandemic has, has developed worldwide, but specifically in Australia. So tell us what's, what's happened there, because that's really played into the narrative from the state Chinese media. Yeah, def- I mean, it's it all started with COVID-19, but before that, let's just go back a few steps. Before COVID-19, you know, relations between Australia and China have actually chilled. It's been on ice for a very long time. It started, you know, five, somewhere I even argue back into, you know, John Howard days. But at least since 2015, you've had a lot of arguments about foreign interference and China, you know, having, you know, people donating money in Australia and Chinese people buying up property. So all that sort of sentiment has led to a bit of an anti-China rhetoric that's going on in, in, in Australia at the moment. Now, the, the coronavirus is a means to an end, I suppose. It's a platform for people to, I suppose, justify or legitimize their racism. You know, they want someone to hate. They need to imagine an, an enemy. And I think that's what has happened. Um, and since the coronavirus outbreak, there's been a lot of racism towards not just Chinese Australians, but all Asian Australians. Asian Australians who were born there, not not born there. Even Kiwi Chi- Asians have, have been targeted. And, and it's been, you know, the whole spectrum of works. You've got, you know, verbal abuse, physical attacks, assaults, you know, just general terrible things that you imagine that you don't want to happen to a multicultural society. 
So, Sue Lynn, I guess now's the time to remind people listening that the number one non-English language spoken in Australian homes is Mandarin Chinese. So what is the sentiment in the Asian community like now? And what has the government done about it? Well, you can imagine people are furious. You know, you know, racism is a terrible thing. It's, 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 it's bullying in, in the first instance. And so the trauma that's experienced by the community is, is tremendous. People don't know if they can go out shopping or, you know, just walk on the street. They might just get kink hit or murdered, you know. So that, that, that sentiment is very, people are nervous. So community have actually, you know, lobbied, they they've they've run petitions to stop this they, you know they've ran they've run ads uh, and and I know certain community groups have talked to certain politicians to support them but the, the government has done what they can they've said to stop racism to tell Australians to stop racism that isn't right that it's not Chinese Australians or Asian Australians should be the ta- the target in this outbreak however aside from words and uh, uh, there hasn't been any you know action to actually uh, stop these unlawful acts. For example, there really ought to be a round of anti-discrimination of advertising on television and, and media. But that hasn't actually happened because there's no funding for it. So essentially, they haven't actually done enough is what the community is seeing. Um, so, of course, not all Australians are racist. There's always a small group of people who are racist, but they're they're very much empowered by this anti-China rhetoric and emboldened by the right wing movement. Just, you know, who think who say that it, it's okay to hate Asians or you know attack them. So this is where we're at. Very delicate part of our of of our society, uh, and it's very fragile. So this sentiment has really played into the Chinese central government's narrative about how Australia is anti-Chinese. Well, certainly. I mean, I mean, both parties have played a part in this stoush and in this spat. Um, you know, one served one to the other and there's this exchange of blows. So what actually happened as, the, as racism went on for a while, you know, over, you know, January through to, to, to April, May, the Ministry of Culture decided to issue a warning to its, uh, to its people saying, uh, telling them to be careful uh, when they visit Australia or when they to, to rethink tourism in Australia. And that came as a surprise for, for, um, for Australia. I said they didn't see that coming, I didn't think. And that was followed very quickly by the Ministry of Education who, told, who said that due to the rise of discrimination towards Asians in Australia, they're asking students to reconsider their studies and study plans in Australia. And of course, the timing of that makes sense because the July semester was about to start and many students were considering whether they should go back to university and start that semester again. So... All in all, look, it looks like a fair travel warning, but it's, you know, laced with political agenda. These announcements by the different ministries in China about the rising anti-Chinese sentiment uh, against students uh, studying in Australia really hits one of the largest export industries Australia has, and that is education. Thousands upon thousands of students come to Australia to study at its universities. And in fact, right now, there are close to 200,000 Chinese students enrolled in the universities, colleges, and language schools in Australia. Now, Sue Lin's told us about what has been published in the Global Times back in June, and it was about that time that an academic based in Australia began an investigation of the sentiment of Chinese students wanting to study in Australia. Marina Zhang, I'm an associate professor at Swinburne University of Technology, I've been doing uh, research on the competitiveness of um, Australian returnees or Chinese returnees educated in Australian universities in China's job market. Then when I heard the the warnings from the government and ministries, and uh, as you perhaps understand, there are a lot of uh, heated discussions uh, in Chinese social media and the people obviously are concerned. So at the time, I just um, uh, designed the questions um, based on my previous research and uh, asked my, uh, my partner in China to run the survey. So that's how this study was created. But she didn't just study students waiting to return to Australia. She looked at two specific types of students in mainland China. Yes, I used two groups. One group um, is um, students who had who hadn't um, had any overseas experience, uh, including um, largely uh, undergraduate students, um, a small number of high school students, and um, even postgraduate students. So they are sort of uh, 
at this very fluid stage, so they don't know where they, they want to go. Another group is um, uh, students who had studied overseas, including 300 and four in Australian universities before COVID-19. And here's what her research revealed about how Chinese government warnings influence students. I guess um, as Australians or as anybody from a democratic country, we often underestimate the voice from the government. But in China, when the warnings were issued by the um, ministries, it was on CCTV news that everybody in China would hear of that. And, and of course, there are heated discussion, debates uh, in social media. And uh, the survey was conducted right after the warnings. So I'm not surprised people would tick that box because, um, um, I mean, before you know the details, before there is time for further um, clarification, interpretation. And if you're in China, that's official voice. What Professor Zhang found was that 60% of those students surveyed who planned to study overseas were no longer interested in making the move. And of those students who had studied in Australia, only 50% were going to return when Australian borders opened again. There were two main reasons cited for this decision, and one was the warnings of potential violence against Chinese people issued by China's Ministry of Culture and Tourism, and the other were the warnings from the Ministry of Education about the dangers of COVID-19 and discrimination against Chinese Australians. But there was another category of answer that rated highly, the deterioration of Sino-Australian relations. I asked Dr Zhang to unpack what that means. Well, since COVID-19, an Australian was sort of considered by Chinese netizens as um, a US ally or follower, especially on the global stage. Australian led the, uh, not accusation, I mean, um, inquiry about um, the source of COVID-19 and uh, and so on. Um, that's fair enough. I mean, every. Every country should uh, stand on its own values. Australia certainly is doing it, and uh, so is China. And China is uh, more assertive on the global stage since the COVID-19. So then you can see sort of um, confrontations between the diplomats between the two countries. So um, And all those developments actually are captured by the social media, by the netizens. Many of them never had experience living in Australia or studied in Australia. So they interpret this as um, a hostile country following the U.S. and uh, putting this stigma on China. And the Netherlands, naturally, they just feel, well, you know, this is a country. If uh, it's so hostile toward China, why I won't go there? Professor Zhang's study picked up on two major influences on students in mainland China. One was the information they were getting from the government, and the other was what they were being told by their families. Uh, We're talking about many people who um, make the decisions based on the, uh, not just themselves, and also on the families of parents uh, together on on the the decision um, such as going to study abroad. So which was the most influential? I guess both. I guess both. I mean, they cannot be separated. And I'm in Australia, and after the warnings, and then my mother, she's an 80-year-old lady, you know, living in China, and she phoned me, and she was obviously uh, concerned about my safety. And she said, you know, I saw the news on CCTV, and are you safe there? You know, the government warned Chinese um, not going to Australia now. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the, the, the thing, you know. Then I've told, I told her mother, I'm perfectly safe. I mean, it's not the picture... You, you saw in China is totally different from my experience here. But uh, you imagine if you are there and, uh, you know, your parents will say, will say to you, hey, here's the warning. Are you really want to go there? I mean, that will have an impact. So I really can't separate the two issues. But the conclusion from Dr. Chang's research is really interesting. At the end of the day, it's not going to be the pandemic or politics that helps Chinese students decide if they want to study at Australian universities or not. Their decision is largely based on the value of Australian degree is um, appreciated by Chinese uh, employers. So that's the fundamental thing. So in the long term, if Australian cannot improve at least the image, a perception 
of、um, quality of education, then Australia will have problems. So now it's time to take you to Perth on the Australian West Coast, a 4,000-kilometer drive west from Sydney, or a five-hour flight south from Hong Kong. Yeah, hi, I'm Jaden Rogers, Chief Executive Officer of Linear Clinical Research in Perth, Western Australia. And this is what Jaden Rogers and Linear Research do. So Linear Clinical Research is a specialist、uh, clinical research centre. We've been、uh, around for ten years now, and a, a subsidiary of, of a medical research institute. We work with global biopharmaceutical companies and specialise in early phase clinical trials. So when they discover a new medicine,、uh, they come and see an organisation like ours、uh, to run the human clinical research. And we've primarily worked with、uh, leading biopharma from initially from the US and Europe, but more recently,、uh, particularly from China. At the moment, they're running phase one clinical trials of a vaccine. Thanks to a near record number of volunteers coming forward to help speed up testing this drug, the drug is developed by Clover Pharmaceuticals, a biotech company based in Chengdu in mainland China. Now, there's all sorts of people who volunteered for the human trials of this vaccine, and I had to ask, what motivates these people, and why are these Australians coming forward to help test the Chinese-made vaccine? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Typically,、uh, we, there's, there's different types of volunteers, but what we've the common theme we've seen in, in this situation is a real passion from many people to contribute to finding a solution or, or in the form of a vaccine for COVID-19. So,、uh, the majority of volunteers that we've spoken to、um, and those who have started on the trial to date have all indicated how, in some ways, they've been personally affected, and whether that. Through their work being impacted, or whether they have vulnerable elderly parents or grandparents, all have connected to the, the personal impact of COVID. Clinical trials of a phase one nature also、uh, they do compensate people for their time.、Um, that's regulated, and it's a it's a somewhat modest amount for the inconvenience. So for some people, that can be a factor as well. But I think in this in this particular case, it's certainly the impact COVID is having, and people wanting to be able to co-、uh, contribute to fighting that. And just how does a clinical research company based in Perth end up partnered with the Chengdu-based biotech company? Fortunately, we've been、uh, in China frequently over the last. It's really come up four years now.、Uh, we saw both the development of that industry quite early, but we also had some fantastic partners who were, really were the pioneers out of China over the last three or four years, who are now making inroads all over the globe.、Uh, so through that, we we spent I spent many、uh, spent much time in China. And so I was familiar with the, the various organisations in China,、um, and Clover's headquartered in Chengdu, and that's actually a sister city to Perth, and we share some similar characteristics, I believe. But yeah, on, in hearing of, of COVID nineteen as a clinical research organisation,、uh, we pivoted very quickly to make sure that we could contribute to this fight. We realised we could play a really critical role, and we active, actively looked out to see what、uh, promising candidates were in, under development, and, and, and found this one in particular. And then we were able to leverage our connection. In China to open up conversations, and, and the rest is history, as we would say. Now, imagine, if you will, what it's like for Jaden Rogers to drive to work each day. He's hearing radio news bulletins, news programs blaring about the rising tensions between China and Australia, terse threats from diplomats, responses from politicians. What's it like to be working in a Chinese-Australian partnership that could conceivably? Help develop the vaccine that ends this pandemic. I think our particular example is actually a, a positive example of that relationship. So, so I actually like to point out that there's, there's still many great relationships,、um, both in the work we're doing, but we see that in the resources industry here in Western Australia and the,、uh, the exploitation of、um, resources into China. So, I think that's a great example of the positive relationship.、Uh, when it comes to fighting a global pandemic,、uh, we're not going to get anywhere as a community. Until we take a global approach to this, particularly if any country wants to get back to normal operations, we need to find solutions and vaccines and, and management plans that span across boundaries and across geographies.、Um, so, so I think in medical research, that that means we tend to be a little bit more,、um, I wouldn't say agnostic, but I think we don't let some of those political tensions inhibit the work that we do. And we're also cognizant that it's it's a very important relationship, China and Australia. It's a long, there's been a long relationship there, and, and in my perspective, I see a long relationship in the future as well. 
This is all we have for you this week from Inside China. Remember to wash your hands and stay safe. I'm Kinling Lo, and I'm Jared Watt. Keep your distance. Stay tuned to scmp.com for all developing news in our 24-hour coverage. Don't forget to rate us and share us on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Thanks for listening. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.